many of you have seen images of a weird looking F-16 with a huge delta wing through the years. The F-16 XL, extra large indeed. And as things usually go, every plane that looked cool but never actually got to be used by the military gets this mystic aura. Oh, just how much would it have been better than whatever other plane it competed against and lost. So this video will compare the said plane with two other competitors. One being the Strike Eagle, against which it was officially in competition, and the other being the regular F-16 of that same time. Would the US Air Force have been better off in either of those two scenarios with the XL winning? F-16XL is ancient history by now. So how about a quick history pop quiz, courtesy of our sponsor Masterworks. What did King Tut and John D. Rockefeller have in common? They invested in art. In fact, the Rockefeller art collection recently sold for 800 million at an auction. Artworks have proven to have some pretty unusual investing characteristics. In more recent history, from 1995 to 2021, art as investment has outperformed the S&P stock index by 164%. On top of that, the art market exhibits almost no correlation to any major asset class, making it a strong portfolio diversification instrument. Of course, few of us are pharaohs or old tycoons. We don't have millions to invest in paintings, but masterworks can help. Masterworks research team analyzes over 60,000 data points to find financially attractive works. Then they acquire multi-million dollar paintings by famous artists like Monet, Picasso and Warhol. And you can then buy shares that represent investment in such paintings. In 2020, they returned 32% to their investors. Last year, their return was 31%. It's no wonder over 300,000 people have signed up. Masterworks is kind enough to offer my viewers priority access to their newest offerings. If you like investing and you want to diversify your portfolio, give them a try. Invest in Masterworks History with the Future by visiting the link below my video. Let's go back to our extra large Fighting Falcon. Indeed, it was quite a bit bigger than the regular F-16. In 1982, when the prototype first flew, the F-16A Block 15 was just beginning to get introduced into service. The XL was 10% longer. Its wing area, thanks to its huge delta wing, was over twice as big, and its empty weight was almost 40% bigger. It all started in 1976, after the basic F-16 design won in its own competition for the lightweight fighter. Harry Hilliker, who was the deputy chief engineer on the YF-16 prototype, led the exploration effort of newer and better F-16 variants. Allegedly, the XL surname of the program came from the similarly named Top Flight XL Golf Ball, renowned for its aerodynamic refinements. Hilliker was a passionate golfer. Extending range and payload of the F-16 were the main goals. Various ideas were thrown around, including an F-16 with forward-swept wings and an F-16 with canards. None went past the models tested in wind tunnels, including a cranked aero wing layout. But coincidentally, the US government was paying for studies of designs for supersonic crews. NASA was heading those, but it needed some partners that could help them engineer stuff. So then General Dynamics, maker of the F-16 back then, partnered with NASA for that program. And out of all those ideas for future F-16s, it became apparent that the cranked aero wing offered best supersonic cruise performance, due to it having the least amount of drag. That was good for NASA's study, but also good for general dynamics. As the NASA program ended after 1977 and even more detailed research was done on the cranked wing layout, general dynamics felt quite confident that the whole idea made sense for a future F-16 variant. So after NASA said it would cooperate on research needed for an actual flight demonstrator, it started a privately funded program to actually make an F-16 derivative with such a wing. By 1978, there was a pretty detailed model, somewhat resembling the later XL, already tested in wind tunnels. That program was called SCAMP. By the 1980s, the design looked pretty much like what the XL showed us. By that point, General Dynamics spent almost 16 million US dollars on this variant. Construction of two flight-worthy prototypes was approved in December 1980. A further 42 million dollars were spent on the program to perfect the prototypes. All the while, the US Air Force was sending mixed signals. From 1980 onward, it supported General Dynamics. It provided two airframes to get modified into the XL prototypes. 
It also said that if it saw potential in the finished prototypes, it would be the one to pay for the flight test program. But at the same time, the Air Force was also called about it. It told General Dynamics it did not have a requirement for such a plane at the time. The plane maker was still funding the development on its own. In July 1982, the first plane, by then named F-16XL, took to the skies. General Dynamics managed to convince the Office of the Secretary of Defense to start a new combat aircraft prototype program. The US Air Force, being a separate office, had other ideas, objecting to that sole plane type program. It wanted to help push the F-15 into further development, and didn't want the other offices dictating what planes should be tested. So in 1982, money was found to fund a series of tests of both the F-15E and F-16XL. That competition became known as the Dual Role Fighter Program. Years earlier, there was the Enhanced Tactical Fighter Program to replace the F-111 strike aircraft, but when air superiority requirements got added, it all morphed into the Dual Fighter Program. Indeed, it was the Air Force intent and the intent of everyone participating in the program to yield a better F-16 and a better F-15, a true multi-role advanced fighter, not just a strike-oriented aircraft. But before we compare the XL with the Strike Eagle, let's see what General Dynamics was aiming for. Their original idea was not to outdo the Eagle, but their own original F-16, hoping the XL variant would supersede it in production someday. The huge cranked aero wing offered some quite revolutionary capabilities. Despite the additional drag due to more skin friction, other types of drag like the supersonic wave, interference and trim drag were lower, so the XL produced less drag overall. And with conformal weapon stations, that value dropped even further, 40% lower than the basic F-16 drag when laden with weapons. The XL actually had more excess thrust in the transonic and supersonic envelope. Those massive wings and longer fuselage also meant there was more fuel stored in the plane. Coupled with less drag, it meant the XL could carry more weapons to a much greater distance. With equal payload, its combat radius was roughly double. The F-16 XL could carry twice the F-16 payload 44% farther, all without external tanks. Though it had the option of using those as well. Its ferry range with external tanks was quite something. Also, its cruise speed was higher by 80 knots. It could almost maintain Mach 1 without the afterburner. Another area where the XL was better was instantaneous turn performance. Basically, turning so aggressively that the speed and lift drop excessively. The angle of attack limit was also better than the F-16s, at 29 degrees. But while the instantaneous turn rate was better, especially at heavier loads, the sustained turn rate was worse. The latter is crucial for classic dogfighting, when planes want to achieve full tight turns and not lose speed. The sustained turn rate at Mach 0.9 and 30,000 feet had the XL perform 30% worse than the regular F-16, both in air-to-air -air and air-to-ground configurations. Indeed, that bad turn rate performance was at the top of the lists of issues for the test pilots. The plane's radar cross-section was 50% lower than that of the basic F-16, though when both planes carried weapons, that advantage became negligible. Weapons payload-wise, there was little competition between the two. The F-16 could be configured as a fighter, carrying up to six missiles, or as a strike plane, usually carrying two missiles and several bombs. The XL was designed to carry more bombs while being able to basically escort itself, not needing additional fighter escort planes. The XL had a bunch of hardpoints. Five of those were big ones for either fuel tanks or 2,000 pound bombs but there were 16 more smaller ones for 1,000 pound bombs. Of course, with this kind of a tight layout, it was impossible to use both the big hardpoints and most of the small ones at once. Given the limitations of the wing design and construction, all the hardpoints simply had to be clustered up so close together, but the drag was still low. One test flight reached the speed of Mach 1.4 while the plane was carrying 6 missiles and 12 500 pound bombs. In practice, the basic F-16 always had to carry external tanks, and was limited to a pair of 2,000-pound bombs, or six 500-pound bombs. The XL doubled that, achieving better range with four big bombs or 12 smaller ones. So was the XL better in everything? Of course not. 
it still had the same radar. Its single engine, being more or less the same, could not hope to provide more power to the avionics. Actually, the XL had a worse thrust-weight ratio than the F-16, being heavier. The latter was by as much as 20% better. More lift and less generated drag helped, but there were still areas in the subsonic envelope where the basic F-16, with its lower weight and just as good of an engine, performed better. The F-16 XL needed longer runways, for example. The program goal was to achieve takeoff distances of 2000 feet at max takeoff weight. But the XL program never managed that in testing, as the planes used roughly 4 to 5000 feet of runway for takeoffs. It's one of the rare areas where the program never met its goal. But to put that in context, the regular F-16 had similar performance, even though it was lighter. It was the landing performance that trailed behind the regular F-16. The XL design meant its approach speed was high and angle of approach had to be shallow. Coupled with the greater weight, the plane simply needed more runway to come to a stop. Sure, there was greater payload and capability involved, but runway lengths are pretty standardized and in reality it would mean fewer bases to use the plane from. General Dynamics claimed it could shorten the runway requirement if full development was to get approved. Aerodynamics and available thrust suggested top speed to be Mach 2.2, but in reality the plane topped out just under Mach 2 due to flight control system issues. That issue too was to be addressed had the plane reached full-scale development. Let's go back to the dual-role fighter competition. When it kicked off in 1981, the competitor F-15E was also tested. McDonnell Douglas had also used its own funds to repurpose an F-15B into a strike aircraft a year earlier, pitching that concept to the Air Force. The summary of requirements was long-range and payload, state-of-the-art long-range radar, adequate internal avionics volume for future growth, high speed, high access thrust, and satisfactory maneuverability. Quite indicatively, Congress back then mandated that the Air Force procure either of the planes, but not both, as there simply did not seem to be enough money to go around. Indeed, at that very time, the Air Force was also finishing development of the stealthy F-117. It was in the midst of developing the very costly Peacekeeper ICBM. It started developing both the B-2 and restarted B-1 development and was already appropriating funds for the program that later yielded the F-22. In their eyes, funding new variants of both the F-16 and F-15 was not needed. General Dynamics was still at the time saying they believed both planes could be procured, and that the two planes offer complementary capabilities. As we know, the F-15E was selected as the winner, come 1984. Looking at those requirements, it's not hard to see that the F-15E was indeed better suited. It could use a bigger and more powerful radar, which was important both for long-range air-to-air engagements and for mapping ground targets. It had more empty space in the fuselage, being bigger, which was important for future additions of various subsystems. Its thrust-to-weight ratio was almost 40% better in the tests. Interestingly, two F-16 XL planes existed, one with a more powerful engine. The latter was used in this video for comparison with the vanilla F-16, but in the Air Force's competition, the lower thrust engine was used, as that was the engine the F-15 was using at the time. The F-15 had better acceleration and top speed, and still had better sustained turn rates. It had similar landing performance to the F-16 XL, and much better takeoff performance. Range-wise, the Strike Eagle is also no slouch, besting the XL a little, though the XL figure pertains to a test with not as much fuel as possible. Missile count-wise, the F-16 XL was behind a little, it was configured for six missiles, they could all be AMRAM-sized, the Strike Eagle could carry up to eight AMRAMs. And payload-wise, despite the many hardpoints that it had, the XL actually could carry fewer bombs, Planes back then were not tested with 1000 pound bombs, though an estimate of future capability is provided here. Equally so, had the XL lived up until today, it would likely have its other hardpoints configured for AMRAMs as well. And the Strike Eagle was cheaper back then to finish development, as it wasn't as radical of a redesign as the XL was. The projected cost for 400 planes for both types was 40% lower for the Strike Eagle. In absolute terms, the Eagle was still quite a bit more expensive per aircraft. 
but in the end the XL lost. The reasons are more or less obvious. The Air Force wanted both a potent air superiority plane and a striker. In the former role, the F-16 XL just couldn't compete. As a striker, it was closer to the Strike Eagle's performance, but still somewhat behind. It had a single engine, while the Eagle had two, which offered some extra safety when flying over enemy territory. And room for growth was definitely more ample on the Eagle. Henry Hilliker of General Dynamics shared his view about the whole deal, saying they did not start the XL program as a competitor to the Strike Eagle. They told the Air Force that the dual role mission should be given to the F-15, but also that the advanced F-16 should complement the advanced F-15. Yet the politics of it all was unrelenting. There was only so much money to go around, and political support for the F-15 was big. The manufacturer and the US Air Force basically had an understanding that if the E variant did not go forward, the whole F-15 family would die out with the C and D models, which ended construction in the mid-1980s. But let's imagine if in the 1984, when the winner was announced, it wasn't the Strike Eagle that won, but the XL. It would have been labeled as F-16E for the twin-seater, while the letter F would have denoted a single-seat variant. It's also quite likely that the two wildly different F-16 models would not be procured for the US. That the US Air Force would eventually switch over to the XL variant completely. It would enjoy the new added capabilities, while the somewhat higher price would not be such an issue. Though the export market might suffer. While some countries would like the XL, a lot of smaller and less wealthy nations that did not require so much strike capability at long range would not appreciate the XL as much. It's plausible that the regular F-16 would continue to be assembled overseas for some time, in Belgium, the Netherlands and Turkey, but long-term export prospects for the F-16 overall, with the possible closure of the basic F-16 line in the US, might be worse off. While still likely successful, the F-16 family might not have reached quite as high production figures that way. Of course, by far the bigger ripple effect of XL winning would be the F-15E losing, if that would have led to the F-15 production line closing for good, as the rumors back then said, then there would be far fewer F-15s in the world. Sure, maybe the US would buy a few more regular fighter-oriented F-15s. And maybe some of the current overseas Strike Eagle users would buy too, instead of the Strike Eagle. But for the most part, smaller countries like Malta role planes. And if the production line closed in the late 1980s, we'd never get the F-15EX today. Interestingly, some other plane types might have profited. Perhaps there would be more F-22s, or more F-117s. The vacuum in the overseas market due to fewer F-16s might have enabled the F-20 to survive and make some sales. And other non-US planes might have made more sales. Some of the issues the XL design had would likely have been partially remedied by the time it entered service, by 1990 or so, like the runway requirement. But the bad sustainment turn rate was inherent to the design. Back then in the 1980s, it was one of the reasons why the US Air Force was not sure about the whole thing, even replacing the regular F-16s with it. Today, with modern missiles and helmet-mounted sights, such a design choice would not be so problematic. One could even say that the design idea came too early. But the price tag and selected performance issues prevented the XL from ever supplanting the regular F-16. The US Air Force had actually continued supporting the project even after the Strike Eagle won. Full-scale development was still actually in the cards. The Air Force was okay for the single-seat variant of the XL to be developed further. General Dynamics hoped there would be a change of heart and that the XL might still get bought. But a year and a half after the XL lost the competition, the budgetary reality hit. The Air Force concluded it had no need for such an F-16 variant after all and called everything off. Later on, the F-16 XL prototypes flew to help NASA's research, but the XL story was finished. And remember, Binkov may talk about hypothetical wars, but only real peace can bring us all together.